My name is Mark Mencher. I've uh, been in, working in the video game industry for the last 27 years. Every time I say that out loud, I'm just quite shocked, actually. Um, I started off as a game programmer, uh, worked myself from game programmer uh, into engineering management. And uh, as of course, as I was leading teams, uh, I had to learn to manage and, of course, hire people. So uh, if you had told me uh, 27 years ago that I wouldn't be a programmer, but I would be a career coach and a recruiter today, I would have told you you were nuts. Uh, but you know, sometimes life brings you opportunities, and what living life is about is about taking advantage of those opportunities. So in the experience of being a recruiter, a programmer, a manager, I realized that what really turned me on about the video game industry was helping people uh, accomplish their goals. So uh, becoming a career coach was uh, just a natural uh, you know, fit. Um, today, uh, I'm really proud to say that I have a team of recruiters and coaches, and we have helped thousands of people obtain game industry jobs. So it's been my pleasure to serve the industry, and of course to speak to you today, you know, about a management topic. Uh, today, um, I'm going to be a little bit more reading my notes than I normally do because, uh, of course, I'm very exacting, and I really want to make sure that you all walk away today really understanding the concept that I'm talking about because as managers, as we lead and try to motivate people and really assign them their work tasks, um, it's important to understand their personality styles because sometimes uh, you don't want to give someone with a personality style that is counter to the, uh, the task that you're assigning to them. So, uh, so that's uh, what we'll be doing today. So of course, let's go to the next slide. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about observable behaviors and uh, not personalities and not temperaments. And I really want to make that distinction because that distinction is quite critical uh, for you to understand. Uh, I've got a challenge here as well. We've got about 45 minutes for me to speak. So um, I hope that uh, all of you are not uncomfortable with my New York fast talking style. I'll encourage you to just kind of sit back, relax. This is being recorded. Many of you have, got, have already have a handout. Uh, those who didn't, I'll make sure that you do get the handout so that you are walking away with some tools tools that not only you can apply to uh, your, your, yourself, but of course to your teams. Thanks so much, Howard. Okay, uh, so I really do understand that some of you who are directors and socializers in the room are going to be quite comfortable with my talking style, and some of you who are relators and thinkers don't particularly like fast talking people and uh, tend to shut off to that. So uh, I'm just really gonna ask you to kind of relax and just kind of go with the flow. And please keep in mind, I'm just trying to uh, educate you as we speed through this process. Okay, so really today what we're talking about is the modernization of the golden rule, which basically says do unto others as you would have do unto you. And you know, don't get me wrong, the golden rule is a great rule to live your life by, especially when it comes to honesty and values and ethics and having consideration for other people's needs. But during interpersonal communication, the golden rule really breaks down and can backfire, and many people just don't know why. So the reason for that is that people don't want to be treated the way, they want to be treated the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. And that's a big distinction that once a manager understands uh, can be quite effective in when you are trying to manage, lead, and motivate folks. When I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area from New York City, I learned that lesson firsthand. I practiced the golden rule by treating everyone in Northern California the way I wanted to be treated as a New Yorker. I was fast talking, aggressive, uh, and frankly, that style turned off the laid back California folks. Uh, so the, uh, the message that I was always trying to get across was not, not often received on the other end because of course that New York aggressive style just didn't play here in California very well. So, uh, you know, obviously faithfully applying the golden rule that's an example of how that uh, does not work uh, sometimes. So you can actually create more problems than, uh, than you can imagine. Uh, again, and that's because not everyone is like you and not everyone has the same priorities about the same things. Not everyone thinks the same way as you do and not everyone processes information the same way. So to go about treating people the way you want to be treated, uh, you can see how that sort of can turn off some people. So, what do, you, what do Donald Trump and Dal Dalai Lama, Robin Williams and Stephen Hawkins have in common? Actually, for this room of managers, 
what I should be asking you, this is kind of the wrong question, the question I really should be asking is, if you were about to go into a meeting with Donald Trump, which is the next slide, by the way, if you were about to go into a meeting with Donald Trump, would you approach that meeting the same way as you would the meeting with Dalai Lama, Robin Williams, and Stephen Hawkins? And if your answer to that is yes, then you're probably going to find yourself in a heap of trouble. Because really what's going to happen is one person out of the four is going to receive your message and the other three are going to be left behind. So uh, that's what we're going to be uh, talking today. Uh, so before I started reading and studying and observing other people's behaviors, I tried to run my business and my personal life the same way. Uh, I kind of t I'm a t kind of take uh, charge kind of guy and uh, I was quite direct and fast paced with everybody so I natu because I naturally assumed that everyone wanted me to get to the point and down to business immediately. What I didn't realize at the time is that my style of communication was turning certain people off and uh, from even hearing my message. And even the good thoughts and, and, the good, and my good intentions in my heart were often failing to hit home with people because, of course, they weren't hearing what I was saying. It wasn't what I was saying, it was how I was saying it. So after applying these principles, we're going to learn today, my, you're gonna, you, my business skyrocketed. People became more open to my ideas. I began approaching uh, people in different ways. Uh, my colleagues, my family, my friends all responded uh, much better toward me than they did when I was uh, working from my one perspective. I also took a really hard look at the type of tasks that I was doing within my own business. And because I learned my strengths and my weaknesses of my own behavior style, I was, uh, be, I be, was able to correctly outsource the work that I knew that really was a waste of my time. So both my profitability and my productivity grew as a result of learning how to deal with people. And you can imagine as a recruiter, I'm talking to uh, hundreds of people a month. And of course, I need to be able to adjust my style to the person that I'm speaking to so that they can hear me. Uh, so again, uh, that's why this relates so well to management. So of course, looking around the room today, uh, we have quite a few different folks and in this audience we're going to have different behavior styles and therefore many of you process information in a different way than I do. Uh, this really key to what I'm trying to teach today is uh, how to learn to tailor your presentation style uh, based around the four behavior styles that, we're, that, we're going, that are here in the audience today. So all businesses are run and staffed by people. Uh, and they're accountable to people, all different types of people. And the more you understand and appreciate and communicate effectively with the four behavior styles, the more happy and effective and successful uh, you are going to be and so is your business and every aspect of your life, as you'll see. Okay, so basically we're going to learn to pay attention to three things people's verbal, vocal, and visual cues that we pick up when we're talking to someone. And using these techniques, you'll easily be able to identify the type of work that is most conductive uh, to that person's strengths and the specific style that they express on the team. What I'm presenting today is a matching process, matching the right people to the right job in the ability to adapt your style to your employees' styles. Uh, help you build rapport and develop long-lasting relationships. When you learn to understand the behaviors of other people uh, and interact with them with their style, it's easy for you to get along with them. When you adapt to another person's behavior style, people will like you more, respond positively to your ideas better, and they will become more happy employees and more productive. And isn't that what we all want out of our teams? You only need to adapt small uh, behavior changes I'm not asking you to be unauthentic or to change uh, you know, your basic core personality. What I am asking you to do is pay attention and adjust the way you communicate to people because some people just don't like direct and fast talking New York style like myself. And, I, you know, and being conscious of who you are and how you come off and present you know, is, quite, uh, is quite helpful. It gets you on the same wavelength of other people and it helps uh, with motivating and, and getting them focused. Um, so slide 11. So consider this, there are four behavior styles and you have one of those styles. And if you treat your employees based on the way you'd like to be treated, then you're only connecting with one of those styles. So, it, you know, so obviously what we want to do is pay attention to those four styles. So of course we have directors, socializers, thinkers, and relators. 
and of course I'll go into quite a bit more detail about what each of these uh, characteristics are. So let's take a look at a director. The directors are great initiators. Directors initiate change, momentum, and growth. Uh, they focus on attaining their goals, and their key need is to achieve their bottom line results. The driving need for results combined with their motto for lead or, or get out of the way is, uh, explains their no-nonsense direct approach uh, for getting things accomplished. Directors are driven by an inner need to be in control. They want to take charge of situations so they can be sure of attaining their goals. Directors want to win. They, are, they may naturally challenge people or practices in, the pro, in process. They accept challenges and they take authority and they plunge headfirst into problem solving. They tend to be independent, strong-willed, precise, goal-oriented, and competitive with others. The demand, they demand freedom to manage themselves and others and use the drive to be on top and become winners. On the other hand, with each of these four styles that I'm going to be talking today about, there are negative traits, especially when those traits are taken to an extreme. Um, and, and any characteristic uh, in an extreme is, you know, can be excessive. Uh, you know, for a director, some of the negative traits can include stubbornness, impatience, the appearance of toughness. Directors tend to take control uh, of other people, uh, and they can, and they have a low tolerance level. Uh, for folks' feelings or their attitudes uh, or their shortcomings. Uh, directors may uh, annoy other people because their constant need to come on top and, and they can come off as offensive. So directors, there are not uh, nine ways to skin a cat. There's only one way to skin a cat and that's the director's way of doing it. I'm sure we all know a director in our life. Directors are, are very fast-paced. They tend to become impatient with delays. This is not unusual for a director to call someone and launch into a conversation without saying hello, without saying how, how, how's it going, without any sort of introduction at all. Basically, you pick up, pick up the phone, you get an email that's quite directed, you could pretty much show that's a director. Directors tend to view others who move at a slower speed as less competent. Uh, the weakness uh, tends to include impatience, intolerance, they have poor listening skills, and uh, they're insensitive to the needs of others. You'll often find directors in the following types of positions. President, CEO, Vice President of Director and Engineering, Business Owner, Executive Producer, Studio Head, Executive Manager, Entrepreneur, and Coach. Okay, let's take a look at some socializers and their, and their behaviors. Socializers are the great talkers. Socializers are great talkers because they, they're friendly, they're enthusiastic, and they like to be where the action is. They, th they thrive on admiration and acknowledgement and compliments and applause. They want to have fun and enjoy life. They're energetic, they're fast paced. They social their socialization tends to place them in more, of a, more priority in a relationship uh, than on the task itself. Uh, they influence others by their optimism, their friendly demeanor and their focus primarily on positive approval from other people. Socializers need attention, they need approval. Admiration and acceptance are extremely important to socializers. Often socializers are not as concerned about winning or losing as how they look while they're playing the game. The socializer's greatest fear is public humiliation and appearing, and appearing uninvolved, unattractive, unattractive or unsuccessful or unacceptable by other folks. Uh, they're frightened form of social rejection and they're threatened by this, so their core need is for approval. As a result, when conflict occurs, socializers may abruptly take flight or more f or it to more favorable environments. Socializers are generally open with their ideas and feelings and sometimes at a superficial level. On the other hand, their weaknesses are too much involvement in too many projects, impatience, aversion to being alone, and short attention spans. They become bored quickly and easily, and when little data comes in there in, socializers tend to make sweeping generalization based on very little information. Socializers love people and specialize in socializing. Most aspects of their lives are, off, are open books, and they're likely to discuss many topics and really have not many boundaries. So you can expect them to be talking about politics, their personal life, their, their relationship with uh, people and their, their wife, their significant other. Um, you know, they're very comfortable in revealing things about themselves. 
So socializers are naturally optimistic people and they really encourage and they pep talk other people on your team so they get them rallied and focused and excited about the projects they're working on. So of course it's very important to have a mix of socializing uh, personality attributes on the team as well as directors. Typical uh, careers that we find social, uh, socializers in are vice president of marketing, sales, uh, public relations, biz dev, customer supports. Of course these are very social uh, positions that we have in our industry, acting, reporting, public speaking, being an MC, being a host, a politician, teacher, these are common careers for socializers. Okay, let's take a look at uh, thinkers. Thinkers, thinkers are analytical and persistent and systematic problem solvers. They're more concerned with logic and content rather than style. Thinkers prefer involvement with products and services under specific controlled, predictable conditions they can, that they can control. They like perfection. Thinkers seek order, precision, and predictability. Uh, the primary concern of the thinker is accuracy. This often means that emotions take a back seat, they believe feelings are more subjective, and they're, quite, uh, they're not comfortable with actually feelings. They quite prefer objectivity. Their biggest fear is uncontrolled emotion and irrational behavior. They are uncomfortable and, uh, and with other folks who display that type of behavior. Thinkers prefer to deal with tasks rather than people, and they like to have clearly defined priorities. They like to operate in a methodical pace, which only allows them to, that allows them to check and recheck their work. They tend to focus on the serious and more complicated sides of the situation. Uh, of the four styles, thinkers are the most cerebral oriented. They make decisions logically and cautiously to increase the probability that they uh, make the best action that's possible. On the other hand, because thinkers like to be right and they prefer checking their process themselves, the tendency towards perfectionism when taken to its extreme can cause analysis paralysis. The overly cautious trait uh, may result in worry in the process and not progressing exactly right, which further promotes their tendency to behave in a critical or a detached way. Thinkers may appear to be aloof, meticulous, and critical. They fear being wrong and making a mistake. They're over-reliant on the collection of information and they're slow to respond or make decisions. With thinkers, are naturally, they're natural observers who ask many questions and they may focus too, fake, focus too much on the downside uh, and, uh, and really want to try to remove all the dangers at the expense of messing up or, uh, on an opportunity or on a bottom line payoff. So thinkers do not readily discuss their feelings nor often their thoughts. So really with thinkers, we must pay attention much more to their nonverbal responses, that little smirk or that body language speaks volumes when you're dealing with a thinker. That's when they really type, that's where they reveal who they are and what they're really thinking. So we look at typical be, uh, careers for thinkers. That tends to be a game programmer, quality insurance, web developer, forecaster, critic, scientist, data analyst, accountants, architects, inventors. Okay, let's get to the next uh, personality uh, style, which are, be, uh, which are relators and they are the great helpers. Relators are warm, supportive, and predictable. They are the most group-oriented of the four styles. They dislike interpersonal conflict so much that when, that when they disagree, they often keep it silent. They, are natural, they have natural counseling tendencies, and they're very supportive of other people's feelings and ideas and goals on the team. Other people usually feel comfortable interfacing with a relator, because of their low-key, non-confrontational nature. Relators are natural listeners, and they like to be part of networks of people who share common interests. Relators focus on getting acquainted and building trust. They are inwardly fr frustrated by pushy, aggressive behavior. They are cooperative, steady workers who function well in a team. They strive to maintain stability and create a peaceful environment with other people. Relators prefer to stick with what they already know and have experience with. Risk is dangerous and very unacceptable to a relator. Disruption in their routine patterns can cause them a lot of distress. 
when faced with a change, they need to think it through and slowly, systematically, piece by piece, prepare for the change. The primary strength of relators are their accommodation and appreciation for the patients of other folks. Uh, they are courteous, friendly, and willing to share responsibilities. They're good at, in, at implementing, uh, they're persistent, and they usually follow through and through the completion of an activity or a plan. Um, they do so because they hate to let other people down, especially other, other people on their team. So on the other hand, some of the negative traits or relators are they have difficulty speaking and expressing their true feelings, especially if it's going to create conflict with others on the team. They appear to get along with others even when they inwardly do not agree. There's this tendency creates an environment where they're, they are a little bit more, with their more aggressive types who can take advantage of a relator's uh, kindness and uh, not, uh, not willingness to be direct in communication. The lack of their assertiveness sometimes results in hurt feelings because they do not let others know how they really truly feel. Uh, they can be overly sensitive and easily bullied. Their need for harmony makes them slower at making decisions. Uh, relators dislike being in the spotlight and prefer working behind the scenes and letting others be the stars and taking credit for their work. They share credit willingly and freely. They choose friends by using the test of time method. Uh, relators tend to have long-lasting relationships. They often keep in touch with childhood friends, former teachers, even retired doctors, because familiar, familiarity breeds comfort for them, and they prefer to live in the same neighborhood or area that they, that they were brought up in childhood. Memorabilia tends to mean more to a relator than it might to some other personality styles. Relators tend to stick with things and have good work uh, that have worked in the past in most aspects of their lives. New or different things do not appeal to them as much as good old tried and true. The same activities others perceive as monotonous often appeal to a, a relator. Uh, uh, persistence is a word often used to describe relators. They do not give up easily and can, pres and can preserve for years. Uh, this single-minded resolve can be taken so far as to be seen as being stubborn. Uh, you often find relators in the following types of jobs. Artist, game designer, human resources, doctor, psychologist, a prof pro professor or teacher, or personal assistant. So, so, you know, we've quickly gone over these behavior styles. And really the first step in really understanding and starting to relate to others is to figure out what your behavior style is. So um, there are two dimensions uh, that help determine what a person's style is, how direct or indirect uh, their behaviors are, and how open or guard guarded they are in revealing their thoughts to others. So when we correctly read both of these dimensions, you have then determined what the person's natural style is, and you're on your way to beginning and building a really awesome relationship with that person. So direct behaviors, a dimension of directness. Uh, dimension of directness deals with the amount of involvement a person uses to meet his needs by speaking or influencing people in situations. Directness means a tendency to move forward, outwardly expressing thoughts, feelings, or expectations. Direct people come on strong, take the social initiative, and create powerful first impressions. They tend to be assertive, fast-paced, and they make swift decisions. They can easily become impatient with others who do not keep up with their pace. Direct people are fast-paced, more assertive, and more competitive than indirect people. Direct people prefer to make rapid decisions, often becoming impatient when things do not move fast enough or do not go their way. Checking for errors is something that other people do. It's too time-consuming for someone who is a direct person. Direct people may enjoy taking risks and want results now or yesterday. Risks are a way of life for them. Not only are they less worried about rocking the boat, they often tip it over and splash around in the hot water. They, are, they, are the, they love and crave excitement, and they do as much as possible to get that in their lives. Conversely, when we look at indirect folks, on the opposite side of the directness spectrum, we find a quieter, reserved group of people. The indirect folks, they may seem uh, more easygoing. Indirect people are, ask questions and listen more than they talk. They typically do not share their opinions or their concerns. 
when asked to take a stand, either way they're pretty tentative. Uh, they, or they prefer to say nothing at all, or they often appear to be more objective and introverted and indecisive. When taken to an extreme, these positive traits can also be viewed as negative, indecisive, tight-lipped, unassertive behaviors. Indirect people are less confrontational, less demanding, less assertive, and less socially com com competitive than their direct counterparts. They allow others to take the social initiative. Uh, for instance, when they want to go uh, to a movie or a restaurant, they might think to themselves, you know, I'd rather see that romantic comedy. Uh, however, when the spouse or their date suggests a action-adventure movie, they often go along without even mentioning their own interests. Usually their desire remains unspoken. Indirect people tend to be more sensitive toward risk, uh, moving cautiously, meditating on their decisions, and avoiding the big change. Uh, as a result, they often avoid taking bold chances and, act sponta and avoid spontaneity. After all, what is the best way to keep from fa failing? One is do, is do nothing. In other words, only to do sure things, sure things result in a higher success ratio. When indirect people flop, they really take that personally. Uh, you can see it as a setback. You just give them a hint that something is going wrong. Uh, and uh, an indirect person who is going to engage in negative self-talk. They're going to have trouble sleeping at night because, of course, they fe feel like a total failure. Indirect people tend to move at a slower pace, more measured pace than direct folks do. Uh, for them, sooner or later is good enough. They speak and respond more slowly since they are more cautious and steadily focused on considering anything before they do a change. So um, reading behavior styles. You know, before we learn to read the, uh, other people's styles, really identifying our own style is the first step. And as you seek to know your style, bear in mind that people are not simple creatures. Uh, they are infinitely complex, and every person possesses in them each of these styles to some degree. Uh, and there are always shades of gray. Things are not black and white. However, people do have one dominant style. Uh, that rises above all the, of the other styles, and that gives them their uniqueness. And yes, there are instances where a person may be direct in one setting, at work, for example, uh, but indirect when they're at home, in their home life. They may uh, be open with their significant other, but guarded with their coworkers. So always deal with people and the person and the behavior that you're observing in the moment, and don't uh, typecast someone forever when you observe that. Really, it depends on what situation and what's happening in that situation so that people switch from being direct, indirect, socializing, not socializing. So uh, you really have to pay attention to the cues that are going on around you in the specific situation that's occurring. OK, so um, I've handed this out to folks, but uh, you can take a look at the uh, descriptions of behavior styles here and decide if you are indirect or have a direct style by looking at the questions and checking uh, next to that and tallying that up, you'll discover um, that uh, you know where you sort of uh, measure in the direct uh, and uh, in you know an indirect uh, you know scale. Um, next, determine whether you express yourself in a more open or a more guarded uh, manner, which will enable you to pinpoint you, uh, your behavior style. So do, uh, you wear your, uh, do they wear their heart on their sleeve, or do they hide their card up their sleeve? In addition to direct, indirect, the other dimension of observable behavior uh, uh, that people exhibit is open or guarded. This second behavioral scale explains the internal motivation that, uh, of our daily activities. Uh, the, the open, guarded dimension relates to why we do things in the way we do them. When combined with these two scales, they explain both the tendency to reveal our, th our thoughts and our feelings, plus the degree to which we tend to support other people expressing their thoughts and feelings. Open people are motivated by their relationships and their feelings, and they're open to getting to know people, and they tend to make decisions based on feelings and on relationships. Uh, the open person is emotionally available and shows it by by talking with body and using vocal inflections and making continual eye contact and communicating in terms of feelings more than the guarded types will do. Other open clues are animated facial expressions, a large amount of hand and body movement, flexible time perspective, 
uh, nonverbal feedback. Open people also like to tell or listen to stories and antidotes, and they like to make personal contact and touch you. They are comfortable with emotions and openly express their joy, their sadness, and their confusion. Open people like to make conversation enjoyable, so they often stray from the subject to discuss personal experiences and interests. Uh, as long as it's in the ballpark of what you're talking about, it's, op it's game for an open person to bring up the topic. An open person might say, that reminds me of the time Uncle Jed did so and so. So that's when you sort of know you're uh, dealing with someone who's got a more open style. Guarded behaviors. Guarded people tend to be more poker-faced. Guarded types like to play their cards close to their chest. Um, in, in the increased probability of getting the upper hand, and they, t they hate to be foolish. Guarded types are motivated by completing tasks and accomplishing their goals. They usually like to keep their distance, both physically and emotionally, and they will not readily touch you, and they will not and don't like to be touched by strangers, uh, nor friends or business associates. Uh, people often comment that once you get to know a guarded person, he's really a great guy. It's just breaking through the ice that's tough to, to get through initially. Guarded people tend to st stand further away from you than open people do. Uh, they have a strong sense of personal space, and they dislike it when someone invades their territory. Guarded people show less facial expression, display limited and controlled hand and body motion. Uh, and they're very aware uh, of their agenda. They push for facts and for details, and they focus on issues and tasks. They keep their personal feelings private. Guarded types typically place higher priority on getting things done. They prefer working with things rather than working with people. Typical comments from a guarded person include, I can't talk now, Frank, or I have a two o'clock deadline to meet, or I'll let you know when I have time to do that. I'll get back to you later, or when I have time to think about it. Because of the time equals money to a guarded person, they're more disciplined about how other people use their time. Guarded types are more matter of fact, with more fixed expectations of people and situations. Guarded people pr prefer to know where the conversation is going. They do not like uncertainty they, uh, they, or indirect chit chat. Um, if you get off the subject, they're likely to ask you how the topic relates to what you're talking about, and they try to bring you back in task and on focus. Because of the uh, different uh, priorities, guarded types often perceive open people as wasting time and being indecisive, and conversely, open people uh, view guarded people as cold, unsympathetic, and self-involved. Typical behaviors. Often people uh, become physically and emotionally closer, open people do. During a conversation, they almost stand on their toes. They are huggers, they're handshakers, they're touchers. They are, they are naturally easy smilers. Uh, they're outgoing and they develop deep relationship with people. Open folks are informal and enjoy quickly breaking down the walls of formality. They'd like to swap first names as soon as possible. And they prefer relaxed, warm relationships. Open people dislike strict structure uh, or time constraints. And they really, really mind other people taking up a lot of their time. Open types are feel, uh, feeling-oriented people. Guarded people do not readily show their emotions. They're more physically rigid and less expressive than open counterparts. Guarded people like to present an image of being in control and not flustered by other people or situations. Guarded people ta are task-oriented. Guarded people are fact-oriented decision makers. They respond to proof and hard evidence in the workplace. They prefer to work alone and there are less emphasis on uh, opinions and feelings of others. Guarded people are champions of time and management. Here's a list of some of the open and guarded behaviors. And again, you could look at the check sheet that I've handed to you and rate your own, your own self and about your abilities and how you pr express in the open and guarded chart. Read each set of behaviors describing on the list and check the ones that most closely describe you. As the previous checklist, remember that one is not better than the other. This is simply a way of being, a beginning to develop the skills of reading behavior styles of yourself and other people in your world. So now that uh, you've had a little time to contemplate and complete both of those checklists, uh, you can determine your behavior style. If you rated yourself open and direct, you're a socializer. If you rated yourself guarded and direct, you're a director. 
If you rated yourself indirect and open, you're more of a relator. If you relate yourself as indirect and guarded, you're more than of a thinker. Uh, for instance, you know, the best way to uh, sort of demonstrate this is uh, to give you a, a, an idea of, uh, of an example, which I'll so, sort of go through. Um, a, and that is, of course, a process of a recruiter or a coach, uh, you know, from my company preparing for a recruiting call. I remember each new encounter with a person over the phone or via email should begin with you seeking answers to two basic questions, which are going to help you get a sense of who that person is. Uh, and what their behavior style is. And this shapes how you adapt your style to uh, the person on the phone or on the other end of the email or communication. Uh, and how you deal with the rapport and build a rapport with that person once you're able to identify their style. So the two key questions you ask is, is this person direct or is this person indirect? Is this person open or is this person guarded? So for instance, let's uh, Get ready, we're gonna make a call. We're calling Sarah Jones. Sarah's a lead client server programmer working at uh, Beta Games, and she's a prospect for a new killer opportunity that I happen to have. You know, you reflect, uh, you know, I reflect back my, com my preliminary conversation with Sarah, or the conversations that I've had with her in the past, to see if I think that she is direct or indirect. Uh, I review the continuum of clues to get a better picture of, of how, what I think she is. So when you, when you originally called Sarah, her voice sounded impatient, and she rushed you, and she talked rapidly. She quickly told you that she was happy in her current job, and she wasn't actively seeking a new job. You really didn't have time to speak with you. She didn't really have time to speak with you, and she really tries to terminate the call as quickly as possible. You, you know, normally in that situation, I just request a couple of more minutes of someone's time to ask them a few questions about their career so the next time I connect with them, I'm more focused in the conversation because I already get that I've got to be someone who's very focused with that person. Um, so I can, you know, so and of course when someone impatiently agrees, that's already beginning to give me clues about what their style is and how I must ad ad adjust my style. During this exploration, I discover that Beta Games is experiencing some financial difficulties, and Sarah admits that she's not sure about the stability of the company or her job. Uh, I ask some more questions about her goals and what turns, uh, turns her on about working in the game in industry and at, at Beta Games itself. I end the call by requesting uh, her personal email and contact information so I can send more information. Um, and um, then I sit back and reflect on what that conversation was about. How open, how guarded, uh, did she allow me to use her first name? So I take a look at my chart and I start to think about what that conversation was and I look at uh, that experience on the continuum. So um, as you think through the conversation, I realize that Sarah really exhibited quite a bit of direct traits. She was very quick with me on the phone. Uh, she didn't have time to discuss with me to, uh, what was going on. She didn't really, she tried to hang up as quickly as possible. So these are direct type traits. Um, you know, her continuing checklist might look something uh, like, the, like uh, the following. Are we on slide 38? Great. So continuing checklist. So uh, although a few items on the checklist could not be determined because it was a brief telephone call, um, I'm best in responding to Sarah as a director. Uh, and I want to follow up with her uh, through, that, through that lens and through that way of communication style. But actually what I've done now is I've actually knocked out two of the personality styles, behavior styles, because she's obviously a socializer or a director. So now I need to look at how guarded or open she was uh, in that conversation. If Sarah is direct, then we must either assume she's a socializer or director, uh, so again, um, thinking through my conversation with her, uh, and I review the open and guarded continuum. You realize that Sarah was very task oriented and spent little time in personal matters or chit chat with me on the telephone. Uh, she seemed very formal, never suggesting I use her first name, and very concerned about the total time requirements of the appointment or the time we were on the phone together. Her, on the open guarded continuum, uh, you might uh, look like, uh, you know, might look like this. That's a check sheet that I've kind of put together on the open guarded continuum for Sarah. So um, I, you know, I walk away realizing that Sarah is a guarded type, and as a result, uh, and her, of her direct uh, her style, she's probably a director, and therefore that gives me clues 
on future conversations and interactions with her on how I'm going to present opportunities and how I'm going to present conversations and, uh, and, and coach her if she comes to me for coaching and career advice. So uh, just to quickly review, and I've given you these slides as well, to help you understand and remember the dimensions, these are a, br a brief quiz uh, on each of the characteristics of direct and indirect. The next slide, uh, we've also got oh, the open and guarded continuum. And uh, you know, I've given you the answers on the bottom for really what you want to try to do um, when you're alone and when you're thinking about this is to really get these, uh, get the difference between direct, indirect, open, and guarded, and to start to use that uh, as a measuring stick when you're interacting with folks on your team. You know, and once you understand your style, then you can understand how to adjust your style so that the other personality styles are receptive to you. You know, it's very difficult when uh, you're a director and you're fast talking to walk up to someone who's a little slower paced and really gets turned off by that style. We all, we all have a CEO or someone who is a boss who really uh, speaks to us in micro bites. And, uh, and for some of us, that's great. We totally get it. And for some of us, we're totally lost and put in the weeds by that experience. So that's what really we're talking about here is style identification. You know, you know besides uh, communication, there are other things that we can look at uh, to determine someone's uh, uh, directness, indirectness, and that is actually their environment. You can look at their office. Uh, and tell immediately uh, what's going on. A director's desk is likely to be busy with paperwork, projects, and materials separated and organized into piles. Uh, socializer environment, they respond to visual stimulation. So they're likely to have everything anywhere you can see, all over the office, all over the floors. Uh, the desk looks like a cluttered mess. They look like they're totally disorganized, and they have piles of paper everywhere. Doesn't mean they are disorganized, but that's definitely a clue that that person's a socializer. A thinker environment, when you walk into their office, they, they, it is totally free from clutter. It is neatly organized, and you notice that the desk is clear except for one file on the desk. Then you likely know that you're in thinker territory when you're in that situation. Thinkers are very neat and highly organized, and therefore so are their environments. A relator's environment, when you walk into their office, Relators of desks contain pictures of their family, of their friends, awards they've won, seminars they've attended. Uh, so it's very it's slogans, you, you know, of uh, you know, group family shots, people of their team, of the company. So you know, a relator is pretty easy to identify when you walk into their office. If you don't have the uh, uh, the luxury of uh, actually seeing the person or speaking with the person, and you're relying only on email. You also can still identify someone's style or get a sense of that. Um, sometimes you, uh, you know, with a director, a director's correspondence tends to be brief and right to the point. They may mention highlights of conversations or, mat or supportive material, but they don't detail them unless it's necessary. They generally include specifics and follow-throughs and raise questions that they want answers to immediately. Uh, socializers' emails look for exclamation points, underlining, bolding, highlighting, colors, smiley faces, you know, graphics, text. And you know that that's a socializer when you get an email uh, that emphasizes emotion-laden content. Thinkers' emails. Thinkers send emails that seek to clarify positions and address process. Consequently, they may become rather long and filled with information and lots of questions in their emails while at the same time being somewhat indirect and intentionally obtuse. Relators' emails. Relators send uh, emails and update people to keep in touch and let you know that they're thinking about you. They're the ones who are going to send thank you cards and happy birthday cards. They're the ones on Facebook, you know, making sure that uh, they've acknowledged your birthday um, or inviting you to an office party or finding out uh, what happened to you that day if uh, you didn't show up to something expected. Um, they're the ones who are inviting you to lunch all the time. Um, and they are the ones who are going to be thanking you or sending thank you notes. So uh, that makes a relator pretty easy to identify. Sometimes we don't have the luxury of email. We have to rely on the telephone. On the phone with the director, again, the director prefers to be brief and right to the point. They may start the conversation uh, right into it. They're quite focused. There's no personal interaction or acknowledgement whatsoever. They often speak in short, a type of shorthand. They're concise. They're pointed. They sound cool, confident, and they're quite demanding. Uh, their phone calls sometimes sound like a human telegram. 
when we on the phone with a socializer, it's a what's up, what's happening, how you doing kind of experience. Um, socializers are open. Uh, their animation and their gesture comes straight through the telephone. Um, just as they, like they were in the room, you know, talking with you or face to face looking at you. Socializers love the phone and using the phone recharges them uh, and it gets their batteries going. They speak rapidly with a lot of emphasis and emotion and they can talk longer and better than any other of the styles. So if you're with someone who you just can't get off the telephone, most likely you're talking to a socializer. Uh, when, when, you, when they call from a shaky cell phone connection, they're the ones who'll talk for two, three, four minutes before they even realize that cell phone connection has been terminated. So uh, that's when you know you're dealing with a socializer. On the phone with a thinker. Uh, thinkers are more formal, time conscientious, and use the phone as a tool. Uh, and they process their task whenever necessary. They prefer brief to the point telephone conversations. They speak carefully, softly, in a non-emotional delivery style. On the phone with a relator, relators are great people, they greet people very warmly. They're immediately on a first name basis with you. Um, they express pleasure in hearing your voice and hearing from you. Uh, they immediately put you on a first name basis. They're patient, they listen to your ideas. And the relators talk slowly and quietly and more even tempered. So wrapping it up, um, what we're talking about is environmental clues in addition to what you see in behavioral clues. Uh, and combining them together will help you for, uh, understand and uh, other people's styles so that you can start to work with them in a, in a better way. Once you're comfortable that you understand their style, you can begin to communicate with them on, the, on their own wavelength because of course you're communicating with them in their own style. It's a much smoother experience. A relationship tension is normal. There's always tension in a relationship. That's something that exists and really cannot be avoided. Uh, but tension can be either constructive or, or deconstructive, uh, and it, but it's always present. So uh, the relationship between p uh, personal tension and productivity has been the focus of a lot of theories. People function best when, when they're in a range of tension that's known as the comfort zone. If tension is too low, there's little to no motivation to produce. And if tension is too high, many, some people just fall apart under the stress and can't perform at all. So really we're talking about pace and priority as well. Pace is a, a person's operating speed um, and um, obviously Priority is what the person seeks most as important as their natural goal or their natural driving force. So behavioral adaptability is really key to success and what I'm discussing here today with you. And communicating your ideas to people of every style, uh, as you continue to develop more adaptability, you'll be more effective interacting with other people and, um, and communicating with them and motivating them. Adapting your behavior style is a big change and change takes time. It also takes practice. At first it's going to feel very fake and it's going to feel uncomfortable. Um, you'll have to pay, you just have to be patient with yourself and be focused and practice because practice makes perfect. The first few times it's really going to be awkward. However, the day will come when you effortlessly read the style of others and adapt your style uh, to match every employee's unique style. You will adapt your counseling style to engender trust. You will adapt your leadership style to inspire action. When you begin to unconsciously read and react to the style of other people around you, this is the magic moment when you begin to directly benefit from teamwork and indirectly benefit by having better relationships, not only at work, but in your personal lives. The decision to employ specific behaviors is made on a case-by-case -case situation. For instance, you may have been flexible with one person and less flexible with another. You may want to be quite flexible one, with one person today and less flexible with the same person uh, tomorrow. Behavior adaptability concerns the way you manage your communication and your action and your strategy. Adaptability does not mean Im Im uh, imitating or mirroring other people's behavior. It does not mean adjusting your directness or your indirectness or your openness or your guardedness. It does not mean being fake. Uh, it really is about being synergetic and on the same page with someone so they can hear what you're saying and what you're trying to communicate in the way they like to hear, not the way you like to hear. So um, 
the willingness to develop and demonstrate behaviors not are not necessarily the characteristics of your natural style or for, or for the benefits of other people is what's called adaptability. Um, behavior adaptability involves making intentional adjustments to your methods in communicating and behaving based on the particular needs and the relationship at a particular moment. And every business leader has strengths and weaknesses. Your ability to recognize and build on your own strength will mitigate the weaknesses you have. This is a crucial component to success in business as well as success in life. So also I wanted to uh, thank the folks uh, here at Design3 who are filming this and participating today. They've been all over IGDA blogging about taking uh, taking uh, uh, videos of our conferences today. Uh, Design3 is an exceptional e-learning portal where they've got thousands of videos, uh, not only to train people who are new to the industry, but to continue to train those of us who are in the industry and need to continuing education. So I really encourage you to check out Design3 uh, as, um, uh, you know, uh, after this conference and event, and of course, I'm sure you'll see some of their stuff. Um, I want to give credit to some of the uh, folks that helped me put this together. Of course, uh, Park University, uh, Coaching, The Platinum Rule, and 21 Indispensable Qualities of Leaders. Uh, so that's what the, these, uh, this theory is based upon. So um, good, I guess I did pretty well for my time constraint. Normally I can talk on for hours. Uh, sorry I was a bit uh, slower and reading more than normally I do, but I really wanted to make sure uh, that I really communicated indirect, direct, open, and guarded so when you leave this room today, you can start to practice that behavior out in the hallway as you're socializing with people. And when you're dealing with different styles, learn to sort of adjust yourself uh, slightly so that you are being heard. You'll notice a big change in the results that you have with your teammates and your team members, with your peers, and even with your bosses. So uh, it's quite an effective style. And I'm as effective as a recruiter and a coach with so many people that I deal with on a daily basis because I have that ability to pay attention to what is going on on the other end and how I'm being received and perceived by the person. You know, when I was younger, and some of you in this room know me from 10 or 12 years ago or 15 years ago, some of the full sale folks over there in the corner, you know, I was very much in my aggressive New York style. And, you know, being at full sail, I really learned that that style, uh, as when I came to California and learned that my New York style really got, could get in my way of shutting folks down. So I really hope today you walk away with that knowledge and understanding that slight adjustments in how you present and how you approach folks really can go a long way in making yourself more related and making people feel more, uh, more comfortable with you. So I'd uh, like to open up the floor and see if there's any questions that I can try to answer for folks.